Hi there, and, and welcome to my, my talk today. My name is Dr. Simon Erridge, and I'm the Head of Research and Access at Sapphire Medical Clinics. And I'm going to be talking to you through a presentation on the UK Medical Cannabis Registry, which is a real-world evidence platform that we've set up at Sapphire Medical Clinics to help collect real-world data on medical cannabis prescribing. I've been taking you through a little bit of a background about medical cannabis, which I'm sure lots of you are already well aware of, but then also touching upon real world evidence and the impact it, it may have on this field. And then finally giving you a bit of an update about the prescribing outcomes that we've seen here um, using the UK Medical Cannabis Registry. Cannabis-based medicinal products are being prescribed with increasing frequency globally. And that's really been seen in the UK since the change in legislation in 2018. Although we haven't seen the uptake in which we would like within the National Health Service, over the past 24 months and, and particularly over the last six to 12 months, we've seen a real increase in the amount of um, prescriptions being dispensed within the UK. And this is largely because there's increasing evidence about the role of the endocannabinoid system in health and disease and how we can utilize phytocannabinoids, that's cannabinoids from the, from the cannabis plants, such as cannabidiol, CBD, or tetrahydrocannabinol, THC, in, in modulating disease. The body's endocannabinoid system is made up of um, numerous receptors and also neurotransmitters which act on those receptors. Looking at the receptors, the two major ones that, that we are aware of is this, the cannabinoid 1, CB1, and cannabinoid 2, CB2 receptors. And these, are, these have been shown to have a, a huge role in terms of regulating sleep, memory, mood, pain, and inflammation. You can see here from this diagram that CB1 receptors are most predominantly based within the central nervous system. Um, with, but are also found within the peripheral nervous system as well, whereas CB2 receptors are predominantly found within the immune system and may have some role to play in affecting inflammation. Looking here closer at a, uh, a synapse between two neurons, two nerve cells, we can see here how endocannabinoids such as anandamide and 2AG act across synapses to be able to regulate um, the firing of, of different neurotransmitters within the nervous system. Phytocannabinoids such as THC, um, which, are, which is both a CB1 and CB2 agonist, can produce similar effects to those of endocannabinoids. CBD has a slightly more nuanced effect, whereas it inhibits the uh, FAR enzyme, which is the major enzyme which breaks down endocannabinoids and therefore increases endocannabinoids. It also has a secondary effect where it modulates the CB1 receptor and, and can therefore um, reduce down some of the effects of THC. And this is where it may be thought to play a role in modulating the side effects um, experienced with THC, particularly those psychoactive ones. As you can see here from this slide, this, the endocannabinoid system and therefore the uh, applicability of cannabis-based medicinal products can be quite wide and broad. The endocannabinoid system is, is found with, throughout our central nervous system, but also throughout a number of essential um, regulatory functions within the human body. And these play a, undoubtedly play a role in, ma in maintenance of good health but also may be able to be modulated in, in, in disease. And we're seeing you know, much greater research to, to, to demonstrate that. However, with this research currently NICE, which is the regulatory body, which um, helps to guide which medications are prescribed within the NHS, looking at a cost effectiveness recommendation, only recommends its use for just four conditions. And these are four conditions where the um, initial first line therapies have been tried and failed to be effective. And this is spasticity in adults with multiple sclerosis, severe treatment resistant epilepsies in Lennox Gastaut syndrome and Dravet syndrome, and in chemotherapy induced nausea and vomiting. Their review also found some evidence for chronic pain, but failed to find any evidence of cost effectiveness. 
Now, within their review, they looked at a number of different randomized controlled trials. And actually, there's a, there's a number of challenges in, in running randomized controlled trials with cannabis-based medicinal products. And actually, um, as the literature currently stands, it perhaps isn't wholly representative of the evidence that we have currently um, on, on CBMPs. That's because it's difficult to run randomized controlled trials on, on whole plant extracts or, and or unprocessed flowers. And this is unrepresentative of, of more mature markets than the UK. For instance, in Canada, 41% of prescriptions are for unprocessed flour. And in Germany, 43% of prescriptions are for unprocessed flour as well. If we, although I don't have the data on the UK market, I imagine that we are heading towards that direction. And there's been limited representation of whole plant products within randomized controlled trials. And the challenges this presents is that the whole plant products are completely different compounds to either um, lab um, created synthetic cannabinoids, um, such as nabilone or tranabinol. And they are indeed different to isolated compounds such as CBD and THC on their own. In addition to that, there's a requirement for good manufacturing processes to be able to run high quality trials in unprocessed flour. Although this is becoming less of an issue, it has been an issue in the past, particularly due to some of the regulatory problems surrounding both the prescribing and the running of clinical trials in, in medical cannabis. And so although this will improve in the future, you know, our research base um, currently is limited. You can see here on, on the, on the right-hand side of the screen, there's a case study here by, by Poli et al in, in 2018. And this, was, this study did a single arm clinical trial of whole plant products using good manufacturing process, which had a 19% THC um, concentration. And in this study, they were able to show improvements at 12 months, including in pain intensity, disability, anxiety, and depression. Now, whilst single arm clinical trials, which are, are in a, which are essentially real world evidence or observational data, do have their own inherent flaws, this clearly shows that there have been significant improvements noted by those by a significant number of patients within this trial. And it's worth taking this into account when looking at the whole, the literature as a whole. Real world evidence or, or real world data which informs that evidence is defined by the Food and Drug Administration in the US, United States as data relating to patient health status and or the delivery of healthcare routinely collected from a variety of sources. And these can range from electronic health records, claims and billing activities, product and disease registries, or indeed um, medication rec registries, which the UK Medical Cannabis Registry is. Patient generated data, including in home use settings, which the UK Medical Cannabis Registry utilizes. And then data gathered from other sources, which can inform health status, such as mobile devices, Apple watches, Fitbits, etc. Looking at the data provided from, from the FDA, we can see that in 72% of, of submissions that include real world evidence for um, FDA approval for new medicines or, um, or new medical devices, we can see that 72% took into account that evidence that was, that was included to support the approval process. And actually the, the principal deputy commissioner of the FDA highlighted this in, in, a, in a recent talk saying that as we continue down the pathway regarding totality of evidence, real world evidence will continue to have a larger and larger role in evidence generation. And this is not just in the United States, within the UK at MHRA, and also within Europe at the European Medicines Association, there are similar processes underway to be able to take into better account the richness of data that can be provided by real world evidence. Coming on to look specifically at the UK Medical Cannabis Registry, um, the UK Medical Cannabis Registry was the, the first clinical data collection platform 
for real world evidence in medical cannabis prescribing within the UK. Within this, patients complete virtual questionnaires, and this happens prior to consultation, and then on an ongoing basis whilst receiving treatment. And that is incorporated with notes taken during clinical assessment in order to be able to ensure data integrity and quality. The data is anonymized, and this allows it to be used on wide, on wide scale data analyses um, by both our in-house team and can be made available on request. And in addition to this, each of Sapphire's clinicians and patients are therefore actively contributing to advancing our knowledge about cannabis-based medicinal products. And this will no doubt go on to help inform future randomized controlled trials, day-to-day um, -day clinical practice, both at Sapphire and elsewhere, but also for regulatory decisions as, as touched upon. The registry is not restricted to Sapphire and is designed to benefit the entire medical community. The UK Medical Cannabis Registry uses a standardized protocol and we collect things that you would expect to be routinely captured during a clinical assessment, such as demographics, which includes gender, occupation, age, etc., and then health information, history and comorbidities. So this in, in captures, you know, comorbidities right the way from um, cancer to high blood pressure to um, anxiety and to depression. And we've picked out those which we think would be very useful in terms of being able to um, both monitor within patients being prescribed UK, um, CBMPs and then follow that up over time. We also collect drug and alcohol history and this is something that we were really interested in, in capturing and then analysing in the future is those patients who are either were either current cannabis users prior to um, seeking a legitimate medical prescription or were ex-users or, or indeed never users and, and how that may affect their, their treatment trajectory. We also collect whether they're on any concomitant medications. So are they on any opioid medications, for example? And then we aim to track this over time to see whether prescribing with, with medical cannabis has any effect on the amount of opioids that patients are taking. And finally, we obviously collect data about the um, medical cannabis products that they are prescribed. The data collection is, is completely remote um, and happens through a bespoke registry platform. And as mentioned, we send them validated outcome scores and patient reported outcome measures um, at baseline, but then also at one month, three months, six months, and then on rolling six months basis to track their clinical outcomes. Those validated assessments I just touched upon can be broken down into those general assessments, which we send to all of our patients, which includes a marker of health related quality of life, which is the EQ 5D 5L, an, anx an anxiety assessment called the GAD 7, uh, an assessment about sleep, the sleep quality scale, and one that assesses change in health status, the patient global impression of change. In addition to this, depending on the condition being treated, um, they are sent a number of um, condition specific questionnaires, which helps us to monitor health outcomes specific to their condition. So you can see here, for instance, that a patient with pain, with a chronic pain condition, would receive all of the general validated assessments, but in addition to that, would also receive the brief pain inventory short form and the McGill pain questionnaire. We've now um, published our first outcomes from the UK Medical Cannabis Registry from um, the first initial cohort of patients that we saw at Sapphire Medical Clinics. And this included 129 patients first enrolled on the registry and it, and it encompassed a wide range of, of conditions. And within this, out, the, within this paper, although it's a, it's a short, uh, over a short period of time and with a small patient cohort, we were able to show statistically significant improvements in at one month and three months in health related quality of life, anxiety, sleep, and also pain and discomfort. Since the publication um, 
of this report, we've gone on to perform a number of different analyses, one being an, an update on this initial um, outcomes analysis of all patients with all conditions treated. But in addition to that, looking at the two most prominent conditions that we see at Sapphire, which is um, chronic pain and then anxiety. These, um, this is a snapshot of the, the data that we um, both analysed and then presented recently at, a, at the International Cannabinoid Research Society conference um, only um, just last month. So looking at the updated all patient analysis, this included an updated analysis of 312 patients. And you can see here on the on the right hand side of the screen, a breakdown of the demographic details of the patients that we've seen. So you can see that there was about a 55 to 45% to split in male to female patients. Uh, average age was around about 45 years with a with an average body mass index of around about 26. So just slightly tipping into that overweight category. Although Sapphire Medical Clinics is a private clinic, you can see that actually the largest occupation group was um, those with an unemployed status, suggesting that even though this analysis was performed of, of patients attending for private healthcare, um, you know, it is, it is likely applicable to patients across all socio-economic uh, groups. Looking at the most common indications for prescribing, you can see here that the three top indications are all different types of chronic pain. So we have um, non-cancer, non-neuropathic chronic pain, so either inflammatory or mixed types of chronic pain, neuropathic pain, and then fibromyalgia, and then the fourth being generalized anxiety disorder. On, on the right, you can see a, a more comprehensive breakdown of, of the sort of less common conditions that we see, including palliative care um, and other mental health conditions, neurological disorders, um, and, um, and childhood epilepsy as well. Looking through um, the drug and alcohol history of the patients, you can see that 42.6% of patients were current consumers um, of cannabis prior to enrollment. And we actually used a, a, no, a novel method of assessing their lifetime use of cannabis, which is gram years, which is grams used on a, on a daily basis times by the number of years used. And you can see here that the, that the average um, lifetime quantity of, of cannabis consumption amongst current users is, is 3.75 gram years. You can also see that, that surprisingly, there is, is a, a lower weekly alcohol consumption amongst cannabis, amongst this population. And this probably is, is likely suggestive of the, of the high um, high cannabis use prior to enrollment in the study with with patients being shown previously to be less likely to be both heavy cannabis consumers as well as um, alcohol consumers as well. Looking now at the results from the study, um, looking at our anxiety outcomes using the GAN7 scale, we were able to demonstrate statistically significant improvements at both one month three months and six months in self-reported anxiety across this global cohort of patients. In addition to this, using the EQ5D5L index value, which is the um, preferred method of measuring health-related quality of life by NICE itself, we were able to demonstrate that patients reported an improvement in their health-related quality of life, again, at one, three, and six months. Using the EQ5D5L VAS score, which is a scale from 0 to 100, which looks, which asks patients to rate how would they assess their, their health on, on that basis with zero being the worst health imaginable and 100 being the best health imaginable. Again, we saw a significant improvement at one, three and six months. 
Finally, um, looking at our, our steep scales, we saw a significant improvement in self-reported steep quality at one, three and six months. Looking, on, looking now at the adverse events that were recorded across the UK Medical Cannabis Registry, we saw that the adverse event uh, incidence was 39.4%. Um, and the most common of these were nausea, dry mouth and som somnolence, which is sleepiness, tiredness, etc. And what this what this shows is actually it's a very um, it reflects very positively against other medications that could be prescribed prescribed in these chronic long term conditions such as opioids, gabapentinoids, etc. Moving on now to focus specifically on the anxiety patients, similar to the all patient group that we just previously looked at. This group also showed significant improvements at one, three and six months in health related quality of life and sleep quality. And it also demonstrated reduction in self-reported anxiety at one, three and six months. And actually we can, we can clearly show that these changes are not only statistically significant, also clinically significant as well. Looking at the GAD7 score, there are clearly defined cutoffs of what is defined as mild, moderate and severe anxiety. So mild anxiety being between five to 10, moderate be between 10 to 15 and severe being 15 and above. And you can see here at both at, at all three markers at the one month, three month and six months, you can see that there has been a drop between the baseline and the, um, and the follow-up data between either of those cohorts. So for instance, in the, in the one month group, they have gone from a moderate and on an on average across the group, moderate anxiety to mild anxiety. Looking at the three month group, they've gone from severe anxiety to mild anxiety. And again, the same at, at six months, gone from severe to mild. Following on to look at pain, our pain patients, again, like the all pa like all patients and the anxiety specific patients, the, uh, the specific analysis of our pain patients demonstrated significant improvements at one, three and six months in health related quality of life, sleep quality and anxiety. But moving on to look at our specific validated um, assessment tools at looking at pain in and of itself, we showed significant improvements at each of those time points, it, both in pain severity, so the pain in, experienced by the patient subjectively, on pain interference, so how it interferes with their day-to-day -day activities, their work, their daily function, their social lives. And then finally on their neuropathic pain scores, so things such as burning sensations, electric shocks, tingling, etc. Across all of these domains, we saw statistically significant improvements in patients prescribed medical cannabis from baseline to their follow-up. So to conclude, the findings that we've seen across the UK Medical Cannabis Registry have been overwhelmingly positive. However, I'm not here to suggest that real-world evidence is a panacea and is the answer to all, our, all of the solutions with the lack of evidence that we have in medical cannabis currently. And whilst it certainly has its place as being an important driver of randomized controlled trials, ongoing clinical care at Sapphire and, and in other institutions, as well as ultimately in regulatory decisions, there still is a clear requirement for randomized controlled trials to take place um, in order to, be, to get that full breadth of knowledge um, that we need. However, the UK Medical Cannabis Registry aims to play a very active role in driving forward education in medical cannabis, both in the UK and indeed globally. 
the pos we've we found positive associations in the groups analyzed to date and we look to build upon those with more specific analyses looking at both other conditions and also looking at specific cannabis-based medicinal products looking to compare those from certain licensed producers and then also looking at um, those with varying contents of CBD and THC and those of varying formulations so flour oils combination etc and over time as we continue to see more patients and continue to collect more data this will this will go on to become a really rich tool in being able to inform medical cannabis evidence in the UK and globally um, so to finish off I'd just like to say thank you very much for listening and if anything has piqued your interest please feel free to get in contact um, with myself on either of the email addresses below. Thank you very much.